Back, we're ready, and here is the big talk with all the pretty pictures, like me. And um, this talk has to come with a health warning because um, that is an article about me. And uh, I did ask them to put a question mark after the dangerous professor, but they said no, they knew better, as did the government when they sacked me. So this is uh, this is me being removed from my position as a chair of the government's advisory council on the misuse of drugs. That's the Home Secretary's hand over my mouth, and he's trying to shut me up. And what I was saying there was um, something that I guess most of you probably would not now find controversial, but 10 years ago it was. I was saying basically that the hysteria around cannabis, and particularly those green chemicals that are in those uh, little plastic bags on the scales of justice, that was largely a politically motivated campaign to avoid the politicians having to grapple with the real problem uh, in Britain in terms of harms of drugs, which would the problem of both alcohol and tobacco. And that was not something the governments wanted to hear, largely because they got a lot of money from the alcohol and tobacco industry. But uh, that doesn't stop it being true. And one of the things I learned, I was, for nine years, I chaired the scientific committee of the uh, advisory council. And, uh, and during that time, I discovered that in the British Misuse of Drugs Act and in the UN conventions, and I'm absolutely certain in your Misuse of Drugs Act, there is no definition of what a drug is. And, uh, and that is a major problem, because basically drugs uh, are controlled uh, arbitrarily by individuals that make up the definition. It's proved extremely expedient for politicians, uh, but they're not the only ones who've benefited. I mean, the de definition that I grew up on was this one. What is a drug? Something when given to a rat results in a scientific paper. And uh, this lady here has got lots for doing that, haven't you, already? Yes. Uh, but I wasn't satisfied with that, so I decided I had to determine my own definition, and here it is something a politician once used but now regrets. And I'll just give you a couple of examples of that. One is uh, Jackie Smith was a Home Secretary who I fell out with when I argued that ecstasy was less harmful than horse riding. And uh, she didn't understand that argument, but uh, she also didn't understand the concept of a drug because when she was appointed Home Secretary, they asked her the question, Jackie, have you ever taken drugs? And instead of telling the truth, which was, yes, but only half a bottle of Chardonnay a night, she said, I smoked cannabis, but I didn't enjoy. And that was a peculiar statement, because she was ahead of the, of the judiciary at the time. And I can tell you, it's a fact, that if you tell the policeman, I've got this drug, but I don't enjoy it, Gov, you're not going to get off. <laughs> it also begs a fascinating question. Why would she take cannabis if she didn't enjoy it? I never had a chance to ask her that question, but because um, she was sacked sooner than I was for a fraud. But uh, <laughs> I think the truth, if I had asked her, the truth would have been that's what you had to do to get into the Labour Party at Oxford at the time she was joining it. And then there's David Cameron. Anyone remember him, the man that destroyed Britain through Brexit? And when he was made leader of the Tory party, they asked him the same question. David, have you ever taken drugs? And he said this. I did things when young I shouldn't have. We all did. Now, you might think we is a, that's a big word, isn't it? But it actually, in his case, it's a very special world, word. It, we, in his case, means eaten, or at the time, the Tory front bench. And those Etonians did a lot of interesting drugs, but they were, because they were conservatives, they actually only did drugs that began with the letter C. And David's very well known for his use of cannabis and cocaine, and I'm sure if Crystal had been around in Oxford at the time, he'd have done that too. <laughs> but he's small fry in comparison with the, the, the great uh, American leaders, such as, uh, such as George W. here. And George W. said, I wouldn't answer the marijuana question. Well, I didn't want some young kid doing what I tried. And you think, wow. That, that should be the question you ask all politicians before you even allow them to stand for office. Because if they can't answer that one logically, 
Yeah, what hope have we got? Well, not much, of course, and it got worse after him, didn't it? Yes, at least now. Anyway, let's look a little bit more uh, seriously about why we care about drugs and drug harms. And mostly, we care about drugs, drug harms, because what we're trying to do with the law is minimize harms. But in fact, it turns out that drugs are controlled not just because they're harmful, but sometimes because they might be harmful. And there's also a huge media influence. A lot of the media, particularly editors of some newspapers, it's a badge of honor. The more drugs they can make get made illegal, the happier they feel about life. And uh, politicians also find making drugs illegal is useful. And some of the public and the international community has you know, created a whole industry. If you, ever, if you ever go to Vienna and go to the UN Office of Drugs and Crime, you'll see a building which is bigger than probably any building in Australia, full of people who are just trying to stop the use of drugs. So it's huge business. Now, I think there are four issues in relation to uh, drugs and drug policy, and these are the four here. And I'm going to talk about the top one which is the relative harms of different drugs. And also, and this is vital, a comparison with uh, legal drugs. And it's only in the last few years that we've even been allowed to talk about drugs and alcohol in the same sentence. And I actually was very impressed that yesterday and the day before at the VADA conference here, it's become a, uh, a very clear statement now, in, in certainly in Australia, that alcohol and drugs uh, other, or alcohol and other drugs, AON, is a really very uh, uh, widely used term because it's exactly right. Alcohol is a drug, and to say it isn't is really quite uh, disingenuous and deliberately provocative and deliberately a, an attempt by the, drug, uh, the drinks industry to avoid anyone really knowing the truth. But there are, there are three other points that we could talk about in more detail at some other, other time, but I haven't got time now. And I began to get interested in the question of comparing drug harms back in 1990, uh, in the 1990s, when um, Ruth Runciman uh, set up a committee to evaluate the British drug laws. And uh, she asked me to serve on that, and I was, I'd just come back from the States, or where I headed up the Alcohol Institute in America, at NIH, in terms of the, the, the res internal research division. And as part of that um, committee, they asked me to tell them and teach them about the relative harms of drugs. And I came up with a nine-point scale. It seemed to me that you could uh, sensibly evaluate the different harms of drugs according to these nine separate points. You can see that, that there are harms relating to the body, physical harms. There's harms relating to addictiveness and dependence. And there are social harms, and I divided them into three. And each of those, um, uh, point, uh, each of those m variables, we gave a, a score of from zero to three. And we, con we conducted, uh, in, in the government, uh, uh, an assessment of the harms of the uh, 20 so different drugs using this nine-point scale. And it was published. It was published, I think, in 2007 uh, this, in The Lancet. And the color coding uh, is, uh, separates drugs which are controlled under the Misuse of Drugs Act and not controlled. And, and uh, it, it was a, the first systematic attempt to do a systematic analysis of the different kinds of harms drugs do. And it showed, actually, there wasn't much correlation between the control of drugs under the Misuse of Drugs Act and uh, their harms uh, in the, some legal drugs like alcohol and Tobacco scored more, had scored more harms or had a higher harm score than illegal drugs not down the bottom there like ecstasy, but, um, psilocybin, LSD, etc. So that was a good start, uh, and it provoked um, quite a significant contribution. I don't know why there's a, a glitch at the top there, but anyway, that man, Larry Phillips, made contact. Larry Phillips is Professor of Decision Science at the London School of Economics. And he emailed me and he said, David, that's a good start, but you could do better if you use this MCDA approach. And I'd never heard of MCDA, but one of the co-authors on that original paper was a man called Colin Blakemore, who was uh, at the time the head of the Medical Research Council. And he and I met with Larry to find out what he was talking about. And he explained to us the power of MCDA 
in terms of dealing with complicated decisions that cover variables which are measured in very different ways. And the MRC and the Home Office, because I was still in favour at that time, contributed to a conference to begin the process of using MCDA to assess drug harms. <laughs>